Let's look at the example of stress and a cantilever beam. And we're going to find in this case that when we have this configuration where I anchor it to a wall and apply a load at the end of the beam, there are some similarities, but quite a bit of difference with the case of where I have a beam in pure bending. So let's recall how to draw a shear and bending moment diagram first of this beam. So here are my two shear and bending moment diagrams. My coordinate direction here is Z and I'm gonna draw them up until the end of the length of the beam. So there's my length L right there where I put the tick mark. Now the shear diagram is quite easy to get because remember the way we do the shear diagram is I make an imaginary slice all along the beam. But with this one, no matter where I slice it, the imaginary slice would give me that the shear force acting on that surface is exactly equal to P. And in this case, due to our sign convention, if you go back and look at those lectures, you'll see that we'll draw it as minus P. So my shear diagram is just gonna be a straight line of some magnitude here of P. So there's the shear. Now the bending moment is actually quite easy to get in this case as well too, because if I slice the beam right here near the end, we would see that there's no bending moment, right? Because there's no, the force is acting over a very, very small distance. As we move away though, as we come closer and closer to the end here, the bending moment increases. And if you go back and look at the lectures, you'll see that we worked this example already. But what it means is that we have a maximum bending moment somewhere down here, negative, with a value of P over L. And at the end point, uh, it's zero, and the bending moment just increases increases linearly from the wall out to the end. So our bending moment is a line. Okay, so what does that tell us? Well, that tells us that this moment we could write as a function. In this case, that function would be the load P times L minus Z. So you can see this has the right behavior when Z equals to zero. Uh, we should get minus P over L. And when Z is equal to L, we get uh, zero, so this works. And so uh, this bending moment means that if we talked about the normal stresses in the beam, right, that remember when we have a bar in pure bending, we have that linear internal normal stress distribution. So if we assume that same stress distribution, in this case, we would have that the normal stress is equal to minus P L minus Z Y over I, where I is the moment of inertia of the cross-sectional area. Okay, so let's take our result from the last page and let's assume that the stress tensor for the cantilever beam is exactly like a beam in pure bending, meaning that there's only normal stresses due to the bending moment. So we, if that were the case, we would have the exact same stress tensor, only we would replace this term uh, where this would represent the bending moment P times L minus Z, that linear dependence of the bending moment on the axial direction Z. So if this were to be a good stress tensor, it would have to satisfy equilibrium. And if we go back to our equilibrium equations, I would don't have to consider some of the forces in the X or Y direction for this tensor uh, because this column is zero and this column is zero, or likewise the rows are zero by symmetry. I only have to consider the Z equilibrium equation. So let's write that out. And so if you go back and look, this would be our equilibrium equation, meaning the partial derivative of this term with respect to Z plus the partial derivative of this term with respect to X plus the partial derivative of this term with respect to Y all have to sum to equal to zero. Now, if this were true, it'd be pretty trivial. These two terms would just be zero, but let's look at the partial derivative of the normal stress with respect to Z and we find instantly that it's not equal to zero, but it's equal to PY over I. And so that means for this thing to be zero, one of these shear stresses or both of them better not be zero. So let's return to our sketch and look at a very simple experiment. So here's our sketch and our cantilever beam. Uh, this is the Z direction, this is the Y direction, the X comes out of the page. So let's look at an experiment here where I take two of my rubber bars, uh, but I'm not gonna actually connect them together. Uh, so I'm gonna pinch them here to cantilever them at this end and then apply a load. And I can apply a load up or down, and I think you see instantly that there has to be some kind of shear stress going on here because these things are sliding, across, sliding past each other along that face. Look at that, so the lines stay, right, and the original configuration are just nice and straight. 
I slide it up and you see that nice sliding motion. If I pinch this and hold it tight and I still push it, we still see there's a tendency to want to slide in the middle there, right? Those lines are coming apart from each other. So that indicates that there wants to be shear stresses along these surfaces. So that certainly seems true that one of these terms better not be a zero. There's, there's a lot of evidence of there being shear. Now, if I stack the beams this way, and again, I do repeat the experiment applying the load up or down, as long as I push equally on our, my two beams, there's no appearance of sliding on the face, which is represented uh, by the face showing out of the page. So there's clear evidence of shear in one of these planes and clear evidence of no shear in the other. So now we just have to be a little bit careful about which of these terms is we expect to be zero. So here and here, and uh, which we expect to not be zero. So if you remember, each row here of the stress tensor is associated with the forces acting on the plane where the normal direct where the normal vector is pointing. So the first row is the normal vector is pointing out of the page, right? It's coming out of the page. That would be the x plane. And there's no shear on the face with the normal vector pointing on the x plane. So I'm pretty happy with there not being any shear stress uh, in that term or that term. I'm also happy with there not being any normal stress in this direction out of the page because there's no mechanism for there to be any force coming in or out of the page. So I'm pretty happy now with the first row of the tensor. Now by symmetry, I, if I'm happy with this one, I have to be happy with this one. And if I'm happy with this one, I have to be happy with this one. So I'm happy with those being zero. I'm also happy with the Y1 normal stress being zero because I don't have any evidence of there being forces in this direction either, that the forces are all due to the bending stresses in Z. So the thing that I'm not happy about is there being shear stresses, right? And they have to be in this plane here, right? Because this row of the stress tensor is the one where the normal vector is pointing, right? The plane that the normal vector is pointing in. So any, any plane I draw, whether it's right at the surface or up there, I have the normal vector pointing in that direction. It's pointing the Y direction. It rep would represent the forces acting there. And that's clearly the plane where I'm seeing a lot of stresses. So that means that this term here, tau yz, and by symmetry, tau yz better not be zero. So in my expression here, I can eliminate that term, but I'm gonna to want to include this expression here. So this is a pretty easy expression to integrate uh, because I could just integrate once with respect to y. That means that what I'd be left with is tau yz. I'm going to move this to the other side of the equation. So it's minus p y squared over 2i plus some constant of integration. And so how would we determine c? Well, we'd have to apply some kind of boundary condition. And the boundary condition we would apply would be is at the surface here, right at the very outer edge, when y is equal to the upper surface of the beam, and by symmetry, the lower surface of the beam, the shear stress should be zero because there's nothing to oppose a force here at the surface. So there can't be any kind of force at the surface. So this is going to have to go to zero at the surface. If the height of our beam were equal to h, you here right, is positive h over two and negative h over two. So if we kind of work that out, what we would find then is that our expression for tau yz, applying the value that the shear stress needs to be zero at the surface here would be the following. And this would be our final result. And we can, we can check that it works because if I'm at a positive h over two or negative h over two, the shear stress goes to zero. And that means when I'm in the center, when y is equal to zero, the shear stress is a maximum. And so that means the shear stress distribution is gonna be parabolic across the cross section of this beam. So it's gonna be some kind of parabola looking shape with a maximum being at the center. Okay, so let's provide a little bit of interpretation here and see if all this makes sense. So this would be our stress tensor. We know this satisfies the equilibrium conditions. 
Uh, here's our cantilever beam, and again, all we're doing to this thing is applying a load P out here at the end. And, and we'll assume a simple cross section that is symmetric, and so therefore our y equals zero line or our neutral axis would fall right along the, the center line here. Okay, so let's imagine that we now take a slice here, so it's a random slice and we slice our beam here. So now I've taken the beam and I've cut it right at that point. So now we've sliced it off. Uh, that means our normal vector of that surface is pointing in the z direction and would have the, would be, ze would be zero, zero, 001. Okay, so what does that mean? So it means, well, if I wanna know what the stress is, uh, acting on this surface, I need to multiply by the normal vector 0, 0, 1. So that means the stress vector acting on a sur surface sliced in the z direction would be, remember, I just do the matrix vector multiply, so that means the x component of the stress vector is 0, so there's no force in or out of the page. The y component of the force, which is would be acting upwards, would be h over two squared minus y squared, all divided by two. And the stress on the z-plane would be L. And the normal stress in the z-direction would be L minus z times y. And this whole vector would be multiplied by the factor P over i. All this means is that we have a normal stress uh, acting here, and this stress, just like we've seen before, is going to be uh, this linear stress distribution, which is going to increase with y and uh, be just be linear in y. So we're going to have a stress distribution that would look something like this, and that would be in the normal direction. We would also have a shear stress, which would be acting along this plane, and it's going to have that parabolic shape we're at zero at the walls and uh, maximum in the center. So let's think a little more deeply about the shear stress that's acting along this cut right here, right? So let's think a little bit about that. So we're going to integrate the shear stress um, along this direction here and into the page, so across the entire cross-sectional area. So what that would be like is if this were our beam, we would be integrating across this entire area. So we integrate with respect to y and with respect to x. So let's do that real quick. So I'm going to integrate twice. And I'm going to pull the p over i out and the 2 as well. And I'm just going to integrate h over 2 squared minus y squared dy dx. And our limits of integration for y are going to be from minus h over 2 to h over 2 and for x 0 to b. So b will be the distance into the board. So I can integrate this with respect to y uh, because I'll just pick up a y here. This will turn into a y cubed over 3 and I have to do a little bit of the turning of the crank. But if I do that what I would end up with is p over i times 1 12th b h cubed. And if we remember for a rectangular cross section, the moment of inertia i is equal to 1 12th bh cubed. So that means the integral of the shear stress across the, this uh, kind of surface, a slice, where I've made a slice in this direction, would equal p, which is good news, right? If I were to slice this beam and I wanted to draw a free body diagram from this part, if I were to draw a free body diagram of a sliced beam, I've got P acting down, so it means I need to have P acting upwards to hold the thing in place. So it's good news that I get that result. So now let's take a slice along this direction, right down the middle. So that means what I want to do is I want to ask the question, what are the forces acting on this surface where the normal vector is equal to 0, 1, 0? So it's what are the forces acting along this imaginary surface where I've kind of sliced the beam right down the middle. Well, so all that means then is to find the stress vector acting along this surface. I just need to take 
the product of my stress tensor with my normal vector n. And remember, I can put I can think of it as a row or column matrix vector multiply with the normal vectors either on the left or the right, simply because the matrix is symmetric, so I can be a little bit sloppy here. So what we want to do to compute the stress vector is this operation here. So we see the x component of the vector is equal to zero, the y component of the vector zero and zero, so those are zero. This is a number, but it's time zero, so the y component is zero. The z component, however, is going to have a value. And so just as predicted, and just as we saw in our experiment, when I have a beam which is not coupled together, there is shear stress, which has a force acting in the z direction, right? Because for those not to slide past each other, there needs to be some force in there, sliding shear force acting in the z direction, but acting on the plane where the normal vector points outwards in the y direction. So let's summarize the state of stress with a few sketches here. So if I make a slice in the beam in this direction, and I make a cut here, the normal stresses acting on that surface are just going to follow um, just like we found in bending. So they're going to have some distribution that was going to look something like that. Where when I pull this direction, the top here is going to be in tension, the bottom is going to be in compression. Is I, if I take a slice a little bit closer to the end, however, so like maybe say location here, the normal stress distribution is going to be the same, but the magnitude is going to be quite a bit, bit less, right? So we're going to have something that looks like that. So the same linear function, but much lower in magnitude as we move towards the end because the bending moment is maximum here and it's zero at the, at the very end where the force is applied. Now the shear stress distribution is a different case. So the shear stress, remember from our shear and bending moment diagram, the shear force is constant as we move along the beam. So if I take a slice, uh, let's say I take a slice here in the middle, uh, the stress along this surface in shear would be the same at this location, this location, and this location. And this stress distribution that we see is that parabolic one where it's kind of maximum in the middle and goes to zero at the walls. But if I take this shear stress here and I integrate it over the area, I get the load P, right? So that has to, this force here has to balance exactly what, um, this force here has to exactly balance the shear stress here. And the way that I've drawn the forces here pointing downward mean they're acting on that face, right? So if I cover this here, those are the stresses that are acting in that direction. If I split the beam in half, of course, we have equal and opposite forces. And then what we've seen is that since uh, if we go back to our little differential element, our, di our little cube that we always drew, and we made arguments about what are the forces acting on this cube, we always said that by symmetry, we always had something that looked like this, right? And so the, the, the shear force that's acting on this plane has to equal one acting on this plane. So the distribution of stress acting along this plane here is going to be a constant because remember the shear is constant at every cross section, whereas the bending increases as we go from the end back. And just to remind yourself with our little model here, when I have these two things connected here, the shear stress right here along the middle is exactly related to what, how we see those two parts want to slide past each other. And this is different than we see when we have a pure moment, because we have at a pure moment, our pieces bend together, there's no sliding in there. So we only have the shear in this kind of cantilevered type configuration.